Hello and welcome to the show. Once again, we have a fabulous lineup of guests to energize and inspire you. It's time to wake up your wow with your host, international award-winning speaker, Kath Vincent. On the show tonight, we hear from actor and improv man, Greg Ward, on what it takes to be a great MC. Colour expert Thelma Vanderwerf translates the language of colour and explains how changing the colour of your clothes can change the complexion of your life. Dr Mike Ashby tells us how getting rid of customers may be the key to a more successful business. And in the Wild Records recording slot with Jesse Wilde, we hear music from singer-songwriter Jasper Hawkins. All this and more to wake up your wow. Greg, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. Nice to be here. You've been entertaining everybody in the break. Now, listen, you have one of those faces that everybody thinks they know. Where do we know you from? Ah, uh, well, I've had the pleasure of doing a uh, number of things on television. Yeah. Um, uh, probably the most uh, well-known one would be my two years I spent uh, doing Spartacus. Mm, that would have been fun. I think we have a shot, actually. Let's see. Have we got a shot of Greg? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, um, but you can see how much they, they relished having me on the show. That could be anybody. Uh, I know. That is you. I know, that's definitely me. That is you. That's me. I mean, having my face obscured was um, something I wasn't particularly happy about, but I had a colleague who said, no, Greg, you've got to look at it in a different way. He says, you've got to say, Greg Ward plays Mercato, the man behind the sword. Yeah, love it, love it. We have got a proper one. Let's see one next to John Hanna. There he is. Ah, yeah, there Fabulous. we go. Fabulous, fabulous. Now listen, <laughs> apart from all this exciting stuff that you've done on TV, you also have a job that most people would hate, which is? Um, well, I work as a professional MC, one of a uh, very small handful of uh, MCs in New Zealand who do this for a full-time living, and I love what I do. Absolutely love it. You see, most people would be like, oh no, I've been asked to MC a wedding or something like that. What kind of tips could you give for somebody who is nervous about doing it and they're trying to learn from the professionals? Ah, well, the majority of people when they are asked to be an MC immediately put it on themselves and that they have to be funny, they've got to, they've got to come up with jokes, they've got to be the centre of attention. For something like uh, a wedding, or well, for any, any place where you need an MC, it's never about the MC. It's about making the event or the, the people that you're working with the stars. And when you turn that focus around and put it externally, uh, things become a, a heck of a lot easier for you. Yeah, OK. And how long have you been emceeing? Uh, Fifteen years and I've been doing this professionally. And how did you get into it? Uh, well, I, I was um, employed to do some roustabout entertainment at Sky City. Um, I've come from a background of being a performer and actor. Yeah. And um, I did this role and the person who hired me said, um, you might be quite good at being an MC. Yeah. And I said, what's an MC? Yeah. Uh, so she said, well, come with us and we'll, we'll show you. And I ended up working with Sky City for around about five years, contracting yeah. to them every Friday and Saturday night, Wednesday nights, ended up running promotions on the uh, gaming floor. And the role was to introduce bands, take bands off, tell people what was going on. And I made a pact with myself that I would have something new to say every single night that I went out. Mm -hmm. It might be only four words or, or a line, but it was something that I could add and feel comfortable in front of an audience. Yeah. And that process enabled me to be able to stand up in front of any audience and talk. Yeah. It's one of those things that is kind of a hidden skill set, isn't there? There is. Uh, an MC is uh, a, a fireman, a politician, um, psychologist, timekeeper, so many different aspects. Uh, that you have to have to have available to you, depending on the circumstances. Yeah, I I I love the variety of that job and the and the fact that there's a great a deal of versatility that goes into it. So how do you get good at it? Practice. Yeah. Like anything, if you if you want to be good at something, you have to do it. If you want to write, you must write. If you want to dance, you've got to dance. And if you want to be a good MC, then you you have to be an MC. You've got to get up and, and do the job. Yeah, I, I suppose for most people, if they are asked to do it once, they only get to do it once. Yeah, that's the challenge that yeah. comes in. Uh, and that's where I think uh, getting good advice um, and taking every opportunity you can to learn about being an MC is really important if you are being placed in those positions. Yeah, and you've done a lot of improv and that kind of thing. How has that helped you? Hugely. Uh, improvisation is, is all about being able to stand up and deliver. And often when you're feeling very uncomfortable about the situation, 
uh, by training and improvisation, you're, you're setting yourself up in a position before you have to go out and do it for real. Right. Uh, when you stand up on a stage, those skills of improvisation come back to you. Right. Very, very uh, uh, worthwhile uh, set of skills to have. And how, how many gigs are you doing a year? You're all over the place, aren't you? I am. I have the pleasure of uh, working here in New Zealand, um, Australia, and the last few years it's been global. So yeah. I've had some great jobs up in Europe and South, uh, South America, Asia as well. Um, I'm averaging around about 85 events a year, yeah. and that could be anything from a single night awards event um, or a, uh, a hoax presentation, which is another another aspect of my uh, business, um, or it might be a three-day conference. So tell us about a hoax presentation. Ah, well, you had a cheeky little <laughs> smile when you said a hoax presentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I started doing hoaxes around about three years ago, um, professionally. Uh, this is where I turn up as a character, and uh, the general uh, character I use is a German, and uh, I will take on the guise of an expert in the field of whichever client I'm working for, but from a European perspective. Right. And then I'll come in, I'll do anything from a 25 minute to 45 minute keynote, um, and it slowly goes awry and off the track as the case so, goes on. So you turn up at a conference, yep. you do a very kind of credible, authoritative keynote in a Correct. German accent, and it's all nonsense. Ah, funny enough, it's not all nonsense. The information's in there, any technical information relating to the industry that I'm working for, or the group I'm working for, is absolutely accurate. Wow. Uh, and it has to be accurate. Uh, it takes me roughly a week of time, spaced out over a, a number of weeks, to do the research for each of these. Uh, but the character itself, or himself, has a lot of foibles, yeah. and they come to the fore. So you're mixing the real information with the elements of this character and his personal life. And, and so, it, and does this character have a name? He Tip changes uh, for every single event. Okay. And the reason for that is that we are so uh, internet connected now that <laughs> yeah. it's very easy to jump on there and, uh, and so do can you, can you give us a burst of one of your characters? Uh, I can. So. Uh, this, we we'll call him Gerhard Schlimmer, Ooh. and uh, this would be, um, very good afternoon, my name is Gerhard, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm from the, the Ministry of uh, Federal Affairs mm -hmm. in Germany, and I'm here with you today to talk to you around about the issues of transformational change, mm -hmm. for it is very important that we change, sometimes <sighs> within ourselves and also externally, and sometimes it is not easy to change. People run from change and some people embrace it. That's and hilarious. some people embrace it more than houses. He <laughs> looks completely <laughs> different, doesn't he? <laughs> I'm looking at him going... <laughs> That's brilliant. And then how do people take it when you kind of go, surprise? Um, <laughs> uniformly, it's, it's thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, over the course of the length of that presentation, I will have uh, given enough key points away, yeah. that the majority of the people in the audience will have already twigged that yeah. this is a uh, uh, not particularly kosher example of a presentation. Um, but at, when you, if you do get to the end, um, then you, you do have people who are, will come up with a kind of look on their face to say, mm, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all in very good fun. Well, it sounds like your job is a lot of fun. It is. I, think, I do believe I have the best job in the world. Yeah, well, hey, it sounds amazing, and um, keep doing it because you do a great job. Greg Ward, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. <laughs> Next up, colour interpreter Thelma van der Berg on what you're communicating through the colours you wear. Thelma, welcome. Thank you. Hey, now you are an interpreter of the language of colour. Yes. Now explain to me how colour is a language. Well, colour is actually vibration or it's an energy and behind every colour is an emotion and a message. And I just interpret the colour choices people make into what it says about them. Wow. Now notice straight away you're wearing this beautiful yellow. Yes. What does that mean? You know, yellow is a happy colour. Yeah. It's also one of the least worn colours mm -hmm. because uh, you really get noticed when you use yellow, and a lot of people don't like that, don't want to stand out. That's why you have yellow traffic signs, yeah. you know, and yellow school buses in the States, because you really pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Now, it used to be really fashionable to have your colors done, to yes. go to, uh, you know, a yeah. personal stylist or yeah. something. But this is way more than that, isn't it? Yeah, the colors done as like image consultants, they use what looks good on you, yeah? yeah? Um, match your, your skin tone and your, your uh, hair color. Yeah. 
And um, this is more looking good yeah, about the image consultant. What I do is how do you feel? How can a color make you feel? And what message are you uh, communicating? Yeah, interesting. Now I've got to ask you, what does this color say about me? It's the, something it's, good. Say something good. Yeah, I'll say something good. <laughs> uh, there are no good and no bad colors. Right. It's just what you're wearing at the moment. It's, it's, it's like a picture. It shows how you're feeling or how you want to present yourself at that certain time. I think it's more coral color what you're wearing and that's just the feminine side of the color red so it's saying that you're quite um, well energized, you're motivated, you feel you feel good about what you're doing and you, you love your job. Oh cool, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say something you're like whoa! No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes you know we're wearing bright colors and we obviously feel good but sometimes we would choose what darker colors if we don't feel so good? Yes, and uh, you can see that often happening to teenagers. They will go through a phase right. where they prefer to wear black. And that is okay because uh, as a teenager, you don't want to stand out too much. Black is the color that makes you blend in yeah. uh, and you'll be accepted by the group. Yeah. Uh, it also is quite strong color in the sense it shows that like strength. Um, however, it will not reveal any emotions. Wow. And for me, the teenager is saying, okay, I don't want any interference from parents or teachers. Just let me be, you know, myself and sort it out. And, um, and that is okay. However, if it goes on too long, um, I would really encourage a teenager to get out of it. Because the black is also one of the few colors that really can hinder uh, growth. Or potential. It's like if, if you put a plant into a black cupboard, mm. it will wither away right. beneath all colors. So if your teenager is wearing black mm. year after year? I would really encourage parents then to introduce something else, mm. another color. Yeah. I'm literally looking around at every color now going, what does this mean? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. So yeah. What, what does, for example, what does orange mean? Orange, orange is a very happy color. Uh, people who love orange, they are often very social people. They like to share their knowledge or whatever they have. They, they work best uh, by doing things. Um, they are very outgoing and they love to be outdoors. Often they love to be uh, doing adventurous sports like uh, mountain biking or, or climbing or just being out. Doors. And so how can people put this to good use to affect the, their work or their play or the results that they're getting? If you are aware of what colours you are attracted to, yeah. you will get insight into your talents and your strengths. And the colours you really dislike, they tell something about your challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and by introducing a certain colour that you really dislike, you are overcoming your emotional block. And so you put quite a lot of this intelligence into online and physical copy books. Yes, yes, because I really would like everyone to learn the language of uh, colour. Uh, so that's why I've written several books about it. Um, one is why are you wearing those colours? Yeah. Why are we attracted to show some colours and what it says about your personality? Um, and also dress to impress is more a colour dictionary. Yeah. What impression would you like to give, which color will help you to get you know, to give that uh, impression. So for example, you could say, oh look, I'm going for an interview, yeah. what color should I wear? Yeah, it depends a little bit what you want to portray and yeah. what kind of job. Yes. Yeah, if you're going for as a funeral director or as an, <laughs> yeah. an uh, outdoor... Yellow! <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it just, okay, it, and that is why it's a color dictionary. You decide what would you like to um, portray. Suppose but, someone you know only wears black and white, what would you say to him? No one we know, no one we know. <laughs> no. As a, again, there are no good and no bad colors, yeah. but color is like a nutrient. Um, and it's the same like if I only eat potatoes and carrots yeah. for breakfast, lunch and dinner, 
I'm missing out on some other nutrients. Oh, I love that. Colors like a nutrient. Yes, mm. it is. Because we need all colors. We need sun. We need light. Mm. So if you were going to, suppose somebody is kind of now thinking, well, OK, maybe, I, maybe I'll rethink what I choose or at least be aware of it. What tips would you give us going forward about the colors we choose? Get one of the books or <laughs> do the online course. Yeah. Because that is my, my, my goal is to teach everyone you know, to learn, to understand and speak this language of color because yeah. it's everywhere and it's universal. And give me an example of colors that you would choose for certain situations yourself. Okay, um, I have two sons and when they were in high school, I used to have to go to parent teaching meetings and they were not the best students. Oh, really? So um, <laughs> I would then wear something soft pink because it diverts aggression oh, or, okay. you know, a confrontation. Yeah. So it would be their very lovely parents <laughs> and uh, just wearing like, okay, don't shoot the, <laughs> me. You know, <laughs> just be nice and uh, yeah, I always gentle. I wear red to mine. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> So that's good. That could have another effect, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah. Thelma, thank you so much for being with us today. I know I'm going to look more closely when I choose what I wear in the morning. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Next up, business coach Dr. Mike Ashby with advice on creating tomorrow's business today. Dr. Mike, how exciting that you're here. Thank you. Now, listen, you help SMEs, small, medium-sized businesses to succeed. But where have you come from? Well, I suppose I've, I've got the kind of background that's equipped me to do that, to work with owners of small businesses. I've worked in, in corporate. I've, I was a partner in an international consulting firm running the strategy team. Yeah. And then I've worked at uh, a couple of years in a very senior role at, uh, at Southern Cross. Uh, I think what I've learned the most about is really just spending the last 11, nearly 12 years doing this, working at it, practicing. Uh, and a lot of it has been about running my own business in, in the course of that. Yeah. So in a way, I'm, you know, like many researchers, I'm the subject of my own inquiry. Yeah. Uh, and some of, the, some of the things that business owners go through are the very things that I've been through, yeah. either in large corporate, smaller business, or, or in between. So what are the biggest mistakes that you see small companies making? Um, I think the biggest mistake is probably that they don't understand the importance of business development. Right. And business development I use in the context of both developing their market and developing their marketing, which is the kind of usual way we think about business development. Mm -hmm. But I have another meaning to it as well, which is developing the capability of the business. Right. And when I talk about business development, it's really about how you create tomorrow's business. And the biggest mistake that business owners make is that they are so involved in running today's business that they don't allow the time and the energy and the resource to create tomorrow's business. So they're busy doing today's job yeah. instead of working on tomorrow's business. And what we help them do is step away from that. And so how do you create that time? I can imagine a bunch of people saying, oh, I haven't got time to think about tomorrow today. Exactly. Yeah. So part of it is just about creating that time. There's only one way to get the time to do these things, and that's to make time carve out some space, carve out some time, especially in your head, to think about what tomorrow's business might look like. Do your job, do it well, get it done, but have this time that you create and the space that you create. And the only way to do that is to let go. Yeah. The only way to create that time and space is to let go of some of the stuff that you currently do. And your people then have to let go of some of the stuff they do in order to create a kind of shared leadership. That's really the goal. Uh, is to create that kind of shared leadership where you and your people, you and your team, are creating tomorrow's business together. Is there some chicken and egg here? I can imagine people saying, well, you know, when I get the business, then I can afford to employ people. But is it that you yeah. need to employ them to get the business? Uh, I, draw, I draw a little picture of a, of a step change, and it's the idea that typically you would, you know, invest in resources when you have the revenue, yeah. and you just keep doing that as the revenue grows. Actually, in many cases, the reality is that you have to invest in the resources in order to get the revenue to grow. Yeah. And that necessarily involves investment. But that's business. You know, what we don't kind of talk about very much as business owners is risk, upside and downside. Mm -hmm. You've, if you don't take risk, you will not get return. You will not get reward. And, and the risk you have to take in business is being prepared to invest in resources and in capability in order to drive the business. If you don't, the business stagnates. It's safe 
in a sense, kind of. It's safe if it's just you or if it's just you and a few people and you kind of, you know, it's not going to go wrong. But the trade-off is you don't get to grow. And with growth comes that stability and security. It's actually more risk to stay small. Yeah. So how can you make the leap if you are a little bit risk averse? Well, I think the chicken and egg thing just, you know, it's, it's inevitably the, the just do it piece. Yeah. You know? So you've got to have the aspiration. And, and I suppose where we help people is helping them get clear about what it is they really want. Because there are people who just, you know, you're too risk averse yeah. to take this on. Yeah. Don't bother. Or you, you want to, you, you know, you want control too much. You don't know how to uh, move away from kind of doing it yourself in order to have control. Mm. So don't bother. Um, you're really hopeless with people, so don't bother. <laughs> you know, if you you're not talking to me, are no, you? <laughs> no, you generically. You know, oh, you universally. You, you universally. You putting the you in universal. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, there's a bunch of those kinds of things that you've got, you've got to have. But in the end, you, you, you've got to be willing to do it. I think it's great to have a guide, and that's what we do. We provide, you know, basically a kind of a, a pilot for you in terms of how to take the business forward. There's only, you know, there are some, um, some simple rules about business, and they apply to all the businesses. Yeah. You know, if they don't apply to you, you probably haven't got a business. So give us, in summary, your simplest tip that we can start doing straight away. Get rid of your D-class clients today. Oh, I like that. Just I was going to end it. on that, but I want to hear more. <laughs> get, ri get rid of your D-class clients. Yeah, D-class clients. So, so these are the people that uh, they either pay low or they pay slow or they give you a lot of grief. Yeah. You know, they, uh, they're difficult to deal with. Um, they're just, you know, their phone, their, their ID comes up on the phone and your staff <laughs> go, oh, oh. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I... I um, I call it the sphincter clients because they are, they are the ones that when, when you see their ID, you sort of go, <laughs> and there's a sort of puckering effect. Okay, so get rid of those. Yeah, That's, get rid of those. Evacuate those. <laughs> if, you, if you will, yeah. The, um, a lot of people say, well, look, um, you never know. You know, some of those Ds might actually turn into A's. Yeah. And, and I say to people, look, you have to understand that statistically is very, very unlikely. You know, your D-class customers are not A-class and drag. Yeah. They are just D-class. Yeah. Get rid of them because the D stands for desperate. Okay, and it's your brilliant. Desperate. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for that last final tip. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks. Guys. Jesse, I'm so excited to be back with us again. It's great to be here. <laughs> now, tell us. Who is recording in the studio right now? We have a singer-songwriter named Jasper Hawkins, originally from Nelson. He's now relocated to Auckland, and he is with his sister Jane singing backing vocals and Christian on guitar. Nice. Well, let's hear from them. Let's do it. i 
this pretty girl oh, so kind And you pick me up from a lonely alleyway Where I can neither live nor stay and There's still some gods and song in these walls Time has a way of healing soon I loved it. It's so beautiful. It just sounds like summer to me. You're very welcome. <laughs> and yeah. hey, that finger picking style, yeah. that style of playing the guitar, that looks like that takes a lot of work. Oh, yeah. I've, um, I've definitely played guitar for quite some time now. It's probably, I don't know, 13, 14 years. And it was actually interesting because I used to play a lot of strumming and I was actually in a punk band back at high school. Punk? And then, yeah, then I ended up getting one of these, a guitar when I went to uni. I wanted something I could sing with and just sitting an electric guitar by yourself is not that fun. And because I already play guitar, I wanted something a little more, you know, interesting. So I started getting into Lindsay Buckingham type music, the Fleetwood Mac, you know, mm -hmm. never going back again. Mm -hmm. the, and this the, is a beautiful guitar you have here. Yeah, this is, um, so this guitar is called Stevie. Right? Stevie. It's, um, they have to have a name, don't they? They have to, yeah. they, they do, <laughs> yeah, she's beautiful. She and um, I made it on a course in Wellington. There's a guy called Paddy Bergen. You made your guitar? Yeah, yeah. There's, but I did it on a course. There's a guy, Paddy Bergen, he's a luthier down in, in Wellington, and he runs a three-week course every two years. Yeah. So it's a three-week, it's quite intensive, six days a week, ten hours a day, and we just... But it's yeah, built from scratch, like they're not kits. Oh, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, based on a, um, yeah, a Martin construction and Martin... A, just well-known acoustic guitars. Yeah. So, wow. So, yeah. And so, and do you yeah. all play together regularly, or how does it all hang together? Uh, well, I wouldn't say regularly. So Christian here, he um, produces all the music for me. So he's oh, yeah. just a man of many talents, <laughs> plays and produces. Yeah. And then Jane is my sister, and I just love singing with her. In fact, I just mm -hmm. I love her. So oh, gotta that's get her, gorgeous. Yeah, gotta yeah. get gotta get her involved. <laughs> but that song, I, I I wrote that most beautiful way, and it just made sense to get her on as the the backing vocals, because I love the way our, our sort of voices work together. Yeah. We just seem to be in tune. Well, it sounds so, amazing. So yeah. thank you so much for sharing yeah. that with us today. Oh, thank you. Well. Come on. Yeah. Thank you. My thanks to all my special guests, to Greg, to Thelma, to Mike, to Jesse Wilde, and to Jasper. And until next week, don't wait to wake up your wow. You're rushing me! <laughs> diva, diva. I really want to be a diva. Not very good at it.